travel log, <laughs> yes. Ah, thank you very much. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. I think we'll um, maybe get started. Welcome to uh, the last uh, Astro Cafe of January 2021. Hope everybody is doing well. Um, just a few reminders as we start tonight. Remind, uh, first reminder is we have an annual general meeting next month. So we are still accepting nominations for uh, the Center Awards and for council members. Uh, Laurie Roche and I still have some calendars for sale. Uh, there, so there are a few left. If you are looking for any last minute uh, gifts, uh, we have them. Uh, I noticed that there's been no update on the membership system yet. So I guess we're uh, a little behind schedule because the hope was last Monday, the new membership system would go live. Um, so uh, stay tuned for something uh, coming out about that. Um, yeah, so it's going to be it's going to be February sometime, Chris. Okay, so it's delayed for some number of times. Okay. Yeah. Very good. And the other thing that I noticed in this morning's um, weekly announcement that uh, went out is that Rask is selling um, through Amazon now, so you can buy some of the like the Observer's Handbook and other things through Amazon. So if you didn't notice that. The information is in uh, the morning uh, or the weekly uh, notice that came out this morning. Um, so for this evening, I have a John uh, had offered a video to us. Um, so we uh, that was possibly on the agenda for last week, but we didn't get to it. Um, Randy, do you still have some items you'd like to uh, do this evening? Yes, and I'm even happier because uh, Mike Nash is here, and so sure. I'll take you. Uh, so we'll have John. On the spot, Mike, to talk about how you do your beautiful pictures. Great. So we'll have John, then you can uh, take over. Um, I've put together a PowerPoint of uh, some photos that uh, Dave uh, Robinson got from Rask Edmonton, and Reg has them on the website. So I can uh, show you those on the screen, and you can see them there. And then I guess we can finish with Reg, uh, unless there's anybody else has anything to announce. Yeah, Chris, just give me a few minutes for the SIGs. Sure. Okay. So, uh, yeah, make note of that. Okay. So, uh, John. Um, okay. Are you a uh, ready to roll? I am. I'll just share the screen. Let's see how this works. And this is a video, so hopefully it will come through on everybody's um, systems well. And maybe we can get the link for it if it's available publicly, John. But if not, well, hope it works. <laughs> Hopefully it works. So you should be seeing a screen now uh, with a uh, YouTube video on it. And I'm just going to make it make it big. And this video is is uh, I should warn you if anyone wants to go to sleep, it's about physics, but it's really kind of interesting physics. It's about something called the page curve, which I mentioned a few uh, meetings ago. This is a video where the fellow that discovered it, who was a colleague of mine at the U of A, uh, will describe it. What would happen if you fell into a black hole? If you'd asked Albert Einstein, he would have told you that according to his general theory of relativity, you'd be sucked into the black hole singularity, the point where space-time curves steeply inward and all the laws of physics seem to break down. After that, nothing can escape. In the 1970s, Stephen Hawking took a semi-classical approach to black holes. Bringing together quantum theory and Einstein's relativity, he proved that black holes emit a small amount of heat that eventually causes the black hole to evaporate. Still, according to Hawking, if you fell into a black hole, you and your particles... You hearing the sound okay? Yep. Okay. ...particles would be lost to the universe forever. This is Don Page. He was a postdoc with Stephen Hawking, where they became friends, despite the fact that they ultimately landed on either side of one of the most controversial debates in modern physics. I looked at <coughs> Hawking's argument and I became not convinced by it. Hawking's work implied that black holes violated a central principle of quantum mechanics called unitarity, which says that the present always preserves information about the past. So how could it be possible that black holes destroy information? This became known as the black hole information paradox, and for decades, it made physicists queasy. According to Page, if you were to fall into a black hole, you wouldn't be gone for good. Particle by particle, the information needed to reconstitute your body would reemerge. 
Well, it would be highly scrambled by the black hole. It'd be much worse than even, you know, if you just cremated the body and, and, and it turned into smoke and ashes. But, you know, another analogy is if you burn up a book and you have all the ashes, the information is still somewhere there, is somewhere in the universe, we believe. The key to understanding why the information is preserved lies in a process called quantum entanglement. When black holes emit radiation, that radiation maintains a quantum mechanical link to its place of origin. If you tried to measure the radiation or the black hole separately, the information would look random. But when you look at them together, they exhibit a pattern. You know, if somebody took a coin and, 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 and cut it in half, and then you sort of shook it up and put it in two envelopes and sent it off to two people, then of course there would be what we call correlations in it. If one person gets a head, you know, the other person would have tails. And this, this quantum entanglement is like that, except it's an even more subtle. This is the page curve which he created to track changes in the entanglement between a black hole and its radiation as it ages. <laughs> the degree to which the information is entangled is called its entanglement entropy. At the start of a black hole's life, its entanglement entropy is zero, since it hasn't emitted any radiation. And at the end, its entanglement entropy is zero again, since the black hole has evaporated. But in between, as radiation trickles out, the entanglement entropy grows. Page showed that, in theory, information can escape from a black hole. In a series of groundbreaking papers, physicists have shown that the entanglement entropy of black holes really does follow the page curve. These calculations give more evidence that indeed the information does come out, but the details of how that actually happens and you know still remain to be remain to be understood. And it, of course, it raises the picture that maybe space-time itself is not fundamental. Maybe there's something deeper than space-time, and maybe the basic quantum description will involve something that's not space and time. So I think there'll be parts of the puzzle, I think, that'll persist for many more decades. Okay, that that's uh, what I wanted to show you. Uh, it's part of what this particular magazine that put this video out claims are the three biggest breakthroughs in physics for this year. Uh, Page himself thinks that might be a little exaggerated, but I'm not sure. Anyway, I'll stop the uh, share. And I just thought, uh, even though it's a kind of a, a weird, uh, esoteric thing. Uh, the next time, you know, in the next few years, somebody asks you about the page curve, you can say, well, you, I heard it first at Astronomy Cafe. An interesting theory about that coming, things coming back out again. So, yeah, it's fascinating. But John, I have a quick question for you. Okay. These guys seem to be totally different than anybody else I've ever even seen and you're close you're close to them because you were one of them how do they think of all this stuff anyhow how do you think of black holes having entropy for pete's sakes i don't know uh, amongst physicists there are there's sort of two kind of distinctly different groups enrico fermi was the last physicist who was both a theoretical physicist of renown and an experimental physicist of equal renown. But nowadays, there are people who do only theory. They tend to think like mathematicians, Gary. Um, I don't. Einstein didn't either, by the way, even though he was a theoretical physicist. He tended to think intuitively, uh, which makes more sense to me. How Don Page gets his intu intuitions and whatnot, I, I don't know. He's a really nice guy to talk to. He gives very uh, understandable lectures and he's a nice person. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Randy, would you like to uh, show a few things this evening? Yeah, and it's a bit of a uh, collection of things. Um, one is, first of all, Mike, 
is very generous on the Facebook showing off his pictures. And uh, Friday night was, was spectacular. I, I want to uh, show that, um, come on, there we go. It really was quite a night. We, I know because I try to catch the moon every time I can see it. And that was, I think the second time in January that I got to see the moon. But there was this wonderful hole in the clouds on Friday night. And uh, Dave showed his picture of Mercury. I hope other people got to enjoy Friday night. And actually the moon is out tonight. It's, it's, it's very good, but um, this is not typical having a hole here that just be having weather system after weather system come in. Anyway, I'll show you some other things, but uh, since Mike is here, how do you take pictures like this? <laughs> uh, yeah. Telescope and a planetary camera. <laughs> but you, you're talking about you have a new telescope recently. What do you have? What's your equipment? Oh, well, this one here is shot with the one that you've got on the screen right now. I, I shot with my my uh, my mains telescope, which is a uh, it's a, a Skywatcher 120 ED. Uh, it's a 120 millimeter f7.5 doublet, and uh, I love it for visual as as well. It's just the, the views with bino bino viewers are just stupendous with it. But when it's it's matched with um, I've got a a, a ZWO ASI uh, 183 mm mono camera. It's a 20 megapixel one inch camera, and um, when I just leave the telescope at prime, no Barlow or reducer or anything, I can get the full moon in the frame. So what you're looking at right now is, is the result of a stack of images, but it's one pane, one, one shot, like one, I don't know, there's no mosaic here. Um, and it, they're, they're well matched. And if the seeing is right, um, I can, I can get sharp pixels like that particular one I shared at full 100% size it wasn't reduced it didn't need to be um, the scene was pretty good that night and um, then I moved from there to on the uh, I, I've got a, a mount that has the two telescopes on it one is the 120 ED and the other one is the scope that I recently got which is um, 180 millimeter seven inch um, max 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 Utov, um, just a you know mirrored design. And the reason I bought that was because of all the mirrored designs. It's the one that you have to play with collimation the least, <laughs> and it's also uh, a very long figured. It's an F15, um, which uh, makes its obstruction, the light obstruction, much smaller than, for example, an SCT design. Um, it allows more light for the, you know, I lose less from, from, uh, from, from the correct, from the, uh, secondary, or, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, um, Mike, Mike yes. you said on your picture here, this is the best 500 of 3000 frames. Yes. Yeah. Um, the, the way, the way to get a nice clean looking image, like, um, with the most detail, although the detail is 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 only part of it, um, is running a, a whole bunch of frames through software that will just select the best okay, so frames. You're, sta you're stacking then? Okay, I get it. I get it. Yeah, I'm stacking a percentage. Yeah, um, for this one, I stacked as Randy said. I stacked 500. I, I stacked uh, 500 of the of the 3,000, and and they're the 500 best frames as determined by software. Beautiful. Is that fire capture or? Yes, uh, that, the capture software is fire capture. And then the stacking, I use uh, something called Auto Stacker, which is freeware, um, yep. brilliant stuff. It, it really does a great job. And then for the processing the stacked file is the last thing. And some people just use Photoshop and it, you know, it does a, a, a reasonable job, but there are applications that specialize in only you know processing this kind of a, a file and I use one of those the one I use is called Astra image um, 
And as far as I know, most people use it for actually astro work, you know, uh, other things in the sky. Um, but uh, I find it, it works fabulously. I, 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 it's intuitive and, and uh, it does sharpening in, a, in an amazing way. So it's nonstop learning though. I mean, I've been doing this for three years, which is not a long time, but I've put a lot of time into it and I'm just touching the surface of, you know, what, I, what can be done. <laughs> the thing that I see is how much contrast you're getting far from the Terminator. Uh -huh. Being able to see these craters halfway through the disc is, is I mean. Part of, part of that actually is, brings up something else that I did on this particular image. And, and I, I shot, now I shoot in mono um, and I used a, a, uh, a green filter here, uh, an imaging green, a Bader, a Bader 520NM green, narrow band. So all the light, all the IR and everything um, below around the 520NM um, was blocked out. Now, one of the, the side effects of that is that the green, the green and that, that wavelength um, will there's more contrast captured that it's it, it's actually inherent in the file itself mm. um, and then and then added to that in processing I will try and bring out I bring out a little bit more yet but mm. but the the shooting in green gets you more contrast How about that for those of us just starting out uh, in this kind of stuff what kind of uh, shutter speed do you have uh, for that image, it was five milliseconds. So, um, uh, what's that? Uh, two hundred. Yeah, two hundredth of a second. Five milliseconds. Yeah. Hmm. And that? yeah, um, that's if I can get away with it. That's what I generally shoot with, and then I'll lower, you know, lower my gain or whatever to to you know to correspond. Mm -hmm. Sometimes um, you know I'll have to shoot longer, but I won't shoot any. I won't shoot any slower than than uh, than ten milliseconds than a hundred. I see. And you estimated your seeing and your transparency. How do you do that? That that is the the million dollar question. It's 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 purely arbitrary. Oh, okay. You know what? And and you'll see you'll see if you look at you know uh, if you go to um, uh, Astrobin and you look at lunar images, you'll see people's ratings, and we all rate it the same. We have our own scale. And, and uh, you know, my four out of five, it could be your two out of five, if you happen to be living in, in uh, um, California or, or Nevada or Florida. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I, I rate it based, I rate it based on what I experience here. Uh, Very nice. Yeah. It's, it's, it really is spectacular. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. Um, this is what I saw. <laughs> And uh, Beautiful. I was I was really again taken. It was it was good seeing that night. It wasn't the best, and the way that I can tell that is this crater here uh, is eight kilometers across, and I can see that. But there's some six kilometer craters that I wasn't able to to look, and I was really trying. Uh, this guy over here is about nine kilometers. This one here is eight kilometers. And uh, so that's kind of how, how I tell. Just for uh, comparison, these two big guys are about 30 kilometers across. Um, this is Clavius, the second largest near side crater. And because of this lovely arc going across it, it is a favorite of, of people who, who know the moon. It is, it's one of the ones that you pay a lot of attention to. This one, of course, is Tycho, the uh, one that causes those rays that go right across. Anyway, Mike also put some detailed photos in that he took on Friday night. And, uh, you know, there are things that, this one is actually called Newton up here, but it looks like it's in this very large crest. Anyway, this was my way of trying to capture that. Um, I spent most of my time over in this area. I wasn't really looking in detail over here, but uh, it sure looks like there's a very large basin there, but I, I think that's just the eyes playing tricks. Hmm. Anyway, 
when um, Mike posted this, then another really very prolific um, uh, lunar photographer named Gary Varney compared his pictures to Mike's because they happened to have taken pictures probably within an hour of each other because uh, Gary took his pictures quite a bit later in his day. He's in Florida, by the way. And so that got me interested. And so um, they didn't take the same scene, but here is Mike's and here is Gary's from the same, uh, the same time. And mm -hmm. you can see how it's the same time. Look how similar mm -hmm. the shadows are. You know, so take a look at this shadow here. And there's a difference in resolution, that's fine. But there also is a distortion. And I don't have the answer yet, but is it because of parallax? They're that makes 5, sense. kilometers apart. And I'm not sure what to expect. This is something that uh, I think I'm gonna have to get a tennis ball and you know, take a look at it and see what it would what it would mean. But um, I was very interested in that. Anyway, then also in the Facebook, I, I saw the, th th this guy, Leo Ertz, um, he posts things like with his 14 inch uh, Cassegrain, um, Schmidt Cassegrain telescope in Belgium, he takes beautiful pictures of the moons of Jupiter. Like, I don't know, it's, it's quite amazing. Anyway, this was his picture. It was done earlier. So oh yeah, that's where he is. So it's another 6,000 kilometers along. But so this is Belgium and you can see the timing. It's quite a bit earlier. You see the, um, you see the, this uh, shadow it doesn't look at all the same as what uh, Gary Varney and what Mike Nash got. But you can see that from west, center, east, or Belgium, mm -hmm. Florida, Victoria, there is a pretty clear change in the distortion. And I imagine one could use that to figure out how far away the moon is. But that's for another day. Yeah. It, it, it's hard to get a handle on because, you know, the, the, the eye will play tricks with the change in shadows and, you know, and, 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 and uh, at least my mind does anyway. Um, my, my eye is fooled easily with, with uh, perspectives. Pretty darn fine picture there, Mike. Yeah. Yeah, I find my, Thank um, you. my brain is also fooled with, uh, lunar observing them in particular, especially if you're using binocular viewers, quite often the craters will pop up at you instead of going away from you. And uh, it's quite disturbing sometimes to watch. <laughs> okay. Is there oh, a Mike, using... you? Mike, with your band or your Baker filter, what's the band path width on that? 520. It's at 520 centered, but how wide is this? You know? Oh. Physically, how big is it? Well, no. How wide is the band? Oh, the, the I'd have to, to the... actually look it up. I, I, okay. uh, I don't even. Actually, I'll just go get it. That'll be the easiest. Yeah, but yeah. They they all have um, transmissivity curves on on the website. Yeah. And nice work, Randy. How long does it take you to do these works of art? That was about an hour. An hour, good hmm. for you. Randy, I, Randy, you use. Um, mainly uh, black and white. Um, do you do the black first or do you no, do the white first? No, I do pencil first and then the highlights because I find with the white pencil, I can't get the fine details. And so I will cover, I will put details on the white with the black pencil. So I use a pencil, like a, uh, a normal graphite mechanical pencil to kind of sketch in so you're just capturing the outlines with the pencil then? Yeah. And then 
I'll put in the highlights and then I'll do the most detailed work with the black. Uh, and then I, I use the kind of a charcoal for the big areas. Yeah, there, I can see there's a definite advantage to you using a, a mid-tone paper because then you don't have to do that part. You just do the white and the black. <laughs> well, yeah, when I did the Explore the Moon program, I did it just black on white and I, I was frustrated with trying to get the highlights. So do you go back, you just keep your eye on the eyepiece and go back and forth with the paper and write? I go back and it. forth and it's wonderful. Wow. And uh, you know, there's a huge tra tradition of this, you know, going back to, well, Leonardo did it just uh, took, took very good drawings of the moon and of course Galileo from his eyepiece mm -hmm. and he couldn't see the whole moon with his eyepiece. Mm -hmm. He didn't have the field of view of the whole moon. Right. Okay, I want to bring up one more thing. I got a call th from a friend of a friend who has this quite extraordinary, uh, what's it called, a sky watcher, 12 inch, she wasn't sure, yeah. that it's not working. And so just on the phone, I couldn't really diagnose it. I had to send some photos but I'm kind of curious when somebody comes to you and says, my telescope isn't working, what do you ask? So I asked for this picture, I asked her to take a picture down yeah. through, and so you can see the spider and, and the uh, secondary. It, and I said, take a picture without the eyepiece. And she says, looks, you can see your eye in the middle there, that, that's yeah, your yeah. phone. So the, and that's, that's the center of the mirror. Big wrong. No, she just probably isn't using it right. <laughs> she's looking in the wrong end or there's something weird that she's doing. That if you just watched her trying to use it, you'd probably see it right away. No, user error, maybe. Could be One user of the things error. to be it's, careful um, with is those, because it's got the extension tube on it, you've got to make yeah. sure it's pulled out all the way. Yes. Yeah, so I those that. have to be out at their ex full extent. Otherwise, you're going to introduce a huge issue. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But I'm just trying to think about who has one of these. I think Nelson Walker had one of these, actually. Uh, Bruce used to. I don't know if he still does. Yeah. yeah it's the collapsible model. Yeah. yeah. I've got an eight-inch collapsible that I bought Same from idea, Bruce. right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and that was my first problem was uh, I couldn't get anything to come in because I hadn't pulled it all the way. It's like there's a double click. Uh, yeah, I just pulled it to the one click and, and I got the second click in and then finally things started to show up in the field of view. Mm -hmm. I don't think they tell you that, but that's pretty critical to have that yeah. distance right. Uh, if not, you end up uh, not being able to reach focus with the focuser. Yeah. I mean, it's a good case of saying this is not a beginner's scope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly big. not. It's not an advanced scope either. Like, it's, oh, it could be dogs are pretty much about as easy as they come. Yeah. yeah the the collapse. It was recommended to me by Bruce because of um, just it just less weight, easier to better transport. better for transport. Yeah. Yeah. And you it, can yeah, it can throw fit it in, in your car. That's right. It can it can sit upright in in a seat belt um, around it. And uh, I was up on Mount Tommy on Friday night looking at Mercury, and there was a young guy Quinn. He's got a twelve inch. Dobinson like uh, but not collapsible it is behemoth and uh, <laughs> yeah so it, you have to lie the back seat down in order to get it into the into the into their large SUV. Probably think, a good thing to get her to do is also to try to aim it at something like during the evening at like some trees in the distance first to make sure she gets the uh, spotting scope lined up properly. Yeah, and, I mean, because if you just go out at night and you point it up at the sky there's such a narrow field of view that you just you're just going to be hunting around in the dark and if it's out yeah. of focus and I think I think it's a good idea to maybe have her take a video of her using it. I think that's a yeah. great idea. You can diagnose it that way. Yeah. I mean I, I don't owe her anything. It's just that uh, she she's saying I've got this lovely telescope mm -hmm. but it doesn't work for her. So if you could just get her to take it outside, even on the front porch or something like that, or front yard, so you could go over there yeah. and just aim it at the top of a distant power pole or whatever, yeah. or, you'll or find out right away um, or, you know, or, what is what is wrong. I have a pretty confident of that. 
or, or haul it down to Cattle Point and have them look at the mountains across the strait. Yeah. That'll tell you pretty quick whether it's a focus issue or an alignment issue. That's one way to see if she's serious. Have her come yeah. up to Cattle Point. She's not willing to move it then. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but uh, the very fact she says it doesn't work sounds like she doesn't see anything. I mean, I don't, yeah, I don't yeah. imagine it's a, a a bit of a bit about quality or anything. I, that, yeah. It doesn't oh. sound like her comment but, is about that. When she took the eyepiece out and looked in, she says that she saw her eye, and so mm. that means it's not badly collimated. No, it would be close. No. Sounds more like focus. It sounds so like it, focus. It, so it could it could be just uh, not, not fully the extended. Tube. Yeah, not not extending the tube. Yeah. I have one like that to start here, and I suggest and an eight inch, and it needs to be fully extended. But I would suggest going out, but before it's dark, but when there's a bright sky, a bright star visible, as there have been quite frequently in cloudy breaks or the moon, something that's far enough away, depending on where she lives and what her her view is from home, she may not be able to get a treetop in focus and find it. And it's much better to have something bright that you obviously see if you just push the scope around mm -hmm. and, and find it and get it sharp and then line up the focuser. That's, I've had trouble with that and I don't like the focuser on this scope. It would oh, like it looks it. good. I thought it Sorry. looks like a pretty, uh, pretty nice focuser, but I guess not. Well, I'm used to a tell rad, and I think it's ridiculous <laughs> to have a have you use something as a, a tell a an optics that inverts the sky when you're trying to find things in the sky to point your telescope at. Yeah. So yeah. I think a red dot finder or a, a tell rad is really better. But a lot of people use them, and I'm I just I'm not experienced with it. But the main issue is to have something sharp distant to focus on and then start the aligning. And I, we have some distant treetops, but they're not adequate for aligning mine from our porch. Mm -hmm. Just my two cents. Well, you're, I agree with you. I agree with you, Dorothy. Good thing, to, good, good thing by the way, just to see if you remotely closes the moon, because you can exactly. see it getting brighter and dimmer when you even get close to it. Yeah, exactly. even if it's out of focus, you know you're on target. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I, I agree that uh, that uh, having an inverted image finder doesn't help finding things around. Certainly <laughs> uh, adding a small red dot finder on that thing would certainly make a lot easier to locate things. Yeah. Is it possible that that's a right angle finder, though? Because it looks like one that I have that is. It, it is, is a right exactly. angle finder. Yeah. yeah, it has a prism on it. Is it a prism or just a mirror? I don't know. There are mirrors on cheap ones. Some of those cheap ones. They're usually correct image. Yeah. Yeah, like not always. What, not always, but that looks a lot like mine. And it and it's it it's a correct image finder. It's a correct image finder. Well, that would make it a lot easier. That would but, that but would to, make... to me, the claim it doesn't work means nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What doesn't work? Yeah. Does the oh. focuser not work? Does the mirror like it was a frustrating phone call because yeah. you know, <laughs> like what doesn't work when my wife comes and says something's broken it's like well what's broken because, don't go there bill don't go there <laughs> no but you know what i mean it's like it's an empty statement because it doesn't define what part she's not getting yeah you're right so yeah. if it's not seeing what she sees through the finder and then it's not in the eyepiece well then that's the finder's misaligned if well, things think, are if things never come to focus, then some part of the optical train is out of adjustment so that it doesn't meet reach focus. These, like Dorothy says, these focusers, <laughs> they're weird on the okay, sky watchers. Exactly what they're they're are, you, for. they are unique in their way that they are like no other focuser I've ever come across. Nothing sort of works with them well. And there's eyepieces that don't work with them and achieve focus. That's sometimes with yeah, the like 22 also. millimeter super plossal. Yeah. Right. And it's got a Barlow, it looks like it's in a Barlow from the looks of it too. So it's probably much too high. No, power. that's the that's the focuser. They're very weird the Is way it? the 
the right, cuff the you. cuff for the one and a quarter Sticks inch that fits into yeah they do and can, can you okay. zoom it Randy? it's a very tall focuser can you zoom in on that on the focuser I yeah know. i think i think there's a the regular helical part and there's another piece that has to be used all the time it pushes it out from the focus see how it's really okay. long yeah mm. it's yeah that's like the extension, I guess. Yeah, yeah I just think, similar to mine. I just, just yeah. look like it might be a bar a little bit, and I guess yeah, with be... the copper, the copper. No, that's the way they are. Okay, they're mm. strange because that's not a two-inch opening. You need an adapter to put a two-inch eyepiece in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's mm. not like your standard where you take the one and a quarter inch adapter out and the two inch will fit in. Uh -huh. No, you need a different adapter for the two inch eyepiece to go in. Mm. It's it's a strange mm -hmm. opening. So the copper colored part is taken out and then you put a different two inch version of that in? The last one that I used, they have a, an older Skywatcher out of Pearson. Mm. And yeah, I, I pulled it out and thought oh, I could put in two inch eyepiece and then it's got like all this, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't fit. It's the it's bigger than two inches. Mm. Ah. So Randy, the first thing you do as you're in your stint as president is you uh, form a Ghostbusters crew instead of, instead of being a <laughs> Scope busters to send them out. Scope busters. Like well, you, this is an awesome crowd. I'm really glad that I brought this up because you where does she live? Ideas. Where does she live? Gordon Head. Oh, Sorry. I think this is a. I think this is a good segue into uh, the SIGs because obviously the beginner <laughs> SIG would be the uh, the yeah. perfect place for something like this. <laughs> I have a Talrad I can part with too if she's interested. Oh, who's that? I think I might be wanting that mic. <laughs> hey, Mike. Hey, Mike. I, I have two. I, I have two. Don't, I, don't ask me why I have two. I don't need to, but I have two. So one one I can part with. So, <laughs> yeah. Mike, that high, the large scale lunar image, was that done with your Mac? Uh, the full disk? The full well, disk no. or the, cl the close ups? The close up with a no, lot of detail. The, the, yes, the close ups was, were. Were the, were the Mac and also a different okay. camera as well. Um, yeah. It was uh, a uh, two megapixel planetary camera. That's the 290, um, right, Mike? That's the 290 mm. Yeah. And those 10,000 frames that I shot for each of them were taken in a minute. Yeah. Oh, 10, can add, I can see in Mike's pictures four kilometer wide um, craters, but not two kilometer wide ones. Yeah. I was just yeah. wondering, Plato tonight, if it's clear, would be a good brightness for going for craterlets. I would absolutely love to do that, but uh, because I, I can see the four big ones with just my six-inch Newtonian. I've never done it. Never succeeded. Yeah, I, yeah, they're, I, they're... Uh, I would so love to. I try and grab every moon night I can, but uh, tonight's just not going to happen. I've got to get up at five. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us, Mike. You know you're not often here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I, 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 I should, I should come more often. But uh, I, I usually put my five-year-old to bed, and uh, seven thirty works out to be a pretty bad time for that department. I, I, uh, nice images, Mike. Mm -hmm. hmm? Really nice images. Thank you. I. Uh, I love doing it, and uh, I I hope that I can max maximize what I my equipment that I have now because I believe you know there's more potential. So, <laughs> yeah, with that, Mac, you need to work on your uh, Williamson certificate for observing the moon with photographs. Well, that might be something. That might yeah, be it something. won't get accepted. <laughs> I'm telling you that right now. <laughs> Unless you write descriptions of everything you see. Well, I, yeah, that's true too. It's, yeah. you'd have to still see them. It, photographs that wouldn't be accepted. No, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, Mike, I, I'm really glad you joined us tonight. It's Reg here. Um, so uh, I, I was wondering where you post your, your images. Is it on Facebook or where do you? Uh... Um, Lately, like the last few months, I've started to mostly just do Facebook, but I also post my stuff that I really, really like. Um, I, I post at Stargazers Lounge. Okay. Um, if you, that, that's, uh, I think they're based in Britain. Like they're, they're, they're a, it's a big worldwide site that, you know, uh, 
there, there's sections for every kind of, uh, uh, you know, astronomy division that there is. It's a, it's a wonderful site. And, and uh, they, have a lunar, they have a lunar imaging section, also a lunar observing section. Um, but uh, the lunar imaging there is, is, uh, is, is pretty good. I don't post there that often, but but uh, my favorite stuff definitely goes there. And I also have my Flickr website and an Astrobin account. Um, so my Flickr has got pictures of my son on there and all kinds of different things. I, I, I came into this hobby through photography, so there's lots of just photography, but most of my moon stuff gets on there too. Um, I haven't put that those very latest images up. I might not put all, but the full disc and um, Copernicus and uh, the last and the other one that uh, Randy noted will will most likely go there for sure too. Uh, well, I think it's wonderful that you took the picture right when Randy was sketching it because uh, it really calibrated Randy's uh, shadows. <laughs> and I, I I was really excited about Randy's image before I saw yours, but when I could compare them. Yeah. Even more. I think you did a wonderful job, Randy. Congrats. Oh, you. yeah. Yeah, for sure. I love how you did uh, your image in the background, by the way, Randy. That's amazing. Oh. <laughs> yep. Very good. Well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, David, should we uh, have a quick talk about the special interest groups? Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, we were just kind of kicking them off right now. Um, I think the first ones that we do, um, I think we'll probably do, well, I'll start EAA next week, I think. And uh, I don't, John, John, I don't know what your plans are. Um, yeah, uh, we're gonna use the, uh, I've already reserved the th third uh, week. Okay. On Thursday at 7.30, okay. third week of the month. Okay. And uh, we got, I've got a, a small group of people that are involved. I'm yeah, glad so to have more. Yeah, so for EAA, I've got about four people right now, but uh, certainly uh, let me know, and uh, maybe our first meeting will be a little bit bigger. Um, the getting started, uh, we're kind of doing a reboot on that. Uh, I think I might do one for the getting started one, uh, just by just having a little chat, like kind of a coffee chat. Um, in fact, I, I would really uh, say to people with these SIGs, um, you don't really have to do too much with them. Uh, they can be maybe just a little bit like an extended version of what we're doing tonight. I mean, it doesn't really have to be too big, uh, too big an effort. Um, in fact, I prefer that it not be because uh, otherwise it becomes really onerous and we're probably less likely to do it if, if it's like that. Uh, so I, I hope uh, everything is good with that. Uh, for anybody who is a lead or a host or a presenter, uh, if you want to have a little session with Zoom, we can we can do that. Um, I, I think John, you're you're fairly well versed, right, with Zoom. Yes, you're okay with it, right? Yeah, I can. Uh, do it. Yeah. Jim, what about you? Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm okay with Zoom. I'm just um, okay. a little little apprehensive with the. Uh, the the whole process of uh, getting the group together, but uh, as you say, if you, if we just start off with a, a chat, then uh, that's probably the best way to go. I've had yeah, I think I, th I think that's all we really need to do, and I really encourage people just just to drop in at least for the first few. I mean, it may not be your cup of tea, but you'll you'll find out. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the main reason for the six, uh, in my opinion, was really just to make connections with people. So you don't have to do anything. Uh, earth shattering in these SIGs. I mean, they're really uh, meant to make points of connection for our members just so that they know who knows what. So, uh, and I'm certainly going to take advantage of that as soon as I find some people that know stuff I don't know, which uh, yeah. probably be a lot. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm really looking forward to them. Uh, so, does anybody have any questions? So, can I make a comment too about the uh, astrophotography one? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, it would be nice to have a combination of some people who, you know, are fairly experienced as well as people that are wanting to learn things just so we can talk. So just so that you know, the first meeting is January 27th, 7.30. And anybody's welcome to come to that first meeting and see if you want to be involved in it. 
So yeah, sounds, if you do, just good. send me an email and I will give you the uh, Zoom link. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, I think I'll drop in on all the SIGs. Uh, I think um, it should be a great way of just getting to know what people want to know and, uh, and what uh, people are knowledgeable about as well. So yeah, I really encourage you to, to have a look at the SIGs. Um, the, the beginners one uh, is morphing. I mean, I think we'll, we'll look at what we wanna do with it. Uh, uh, I think at, at a minimum, I think we should uh, maybe with the beginners group kind of start building resource lists perhaps for people. Uh, there's lots of stuff from National. I uh, just want to let people know that. And um, I don't know is, I think I'm think it was Lori that told me that they're thinking of um, doing a program on the moon actually next and maybe uh, revisiting uh, Explore the Universe as well. So lots of resources there. Yeah, that is the plan, you... David. Yeah, the um, moon should start in March. That's great. Is that FDAO or is that uh, RAS National? You're RAS talking? National. Okay. Doing the observer certificate, observe the moon. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think FDAO is doing anything like that. But I'm. I'm speaking of national, RAS National. Oh, uh, Margie, you just uh, partook in the Kalamazoo uh, thing. Can you tell us a little bit about it. Uh, yes, well, it's running every two weeks, and the first session was on Saturday, and what they did was an overview, an overview of the universe. It's quite informative. Oh. So we just looked at kind of where things came from and then looked at each one of the planets and, and, its, and each uh, planet's moons and um, just gave a, uh, uh, an overview of, of our place in the universe. So uh, it, the video is now on the Kalamazoo, Michigan Astronomy website. Yes, so, I saw that. Yes, so if anybody wants to see what they did for the first session, um, it's there. And then the list of other sessions is there as well. And they are happening every every two weeks. Yeah, I, I had a look at it. It looks like the very last one's on astrophotography as well. Yeah, it, it looks pretty comprehensive. Mar Margie, how many people were on your uh, session on Saturday? Did you know how many logged in? Um... I can't remember. <laughs> I think it was about 700. They were wow. from all over the world. I'm doing it as well. And uh, they were people from Britain, someone from the Philippines, lots from the States. It was quite, quite an event. I, I quite enjoyed it as well. So Derek, did, did you think it was too simplistic or did you think it was about just right? Uh, it was just right for me. Um, I knew a little bit about everything that was covered, but I learned the next level of something on everything that was covered. So um, uh, it, for me, I, I think for most of you, you would have known a lot higher percentage of the total content. But uh, for me, it was pitched just right. <laughs> um, so I... Um, I uh, was very pleased actually with it. I'm going to make sure I do the other sessions as well. I, I corresponded with the uh, president of the Kalamazoo Astronomy Club, and he said they've been doing it about eight years now in a live format. This is the first time uh, offline. So they've had a, or, or uh, uh, to, to put it on virtually. So they've had uh, a good run at this and probably have refined their product quite quite nicely by this time. Yes, and the, uh, the main presenter is also sort of segued into actually teaching. He didn't say where Margie, I don't remember, but uh, at some college or, or university. So he's actually teaching, uh, you, using that basic uh, stuff to, to teach an astronomy course as well. So I think there's a bit of iteration between the uh, the teaching component of what he was doing and and putting on this uh, this uh, course for the uh, society there, because um, he said I think that he took a break from doing 
the actual um, online thing or, or the course um, for about seven or eight years what, because he was teaching. But um, no, it's, uh, it's great. <laughs> I liked it a lot. Great. That's excellent. So anyways, um, have a look on the website. Uh, you can see, um, or actually uh, this uh, month's Sky News as well. You can get information about uh, about the SIGs, and you can always uh, uh, sort of send me a note as well. Great, thanks. Thanks, David, and uh, everybody else there. Um, Dave, shall we have a look at uh, Edmonton Photos? Sure. Okay, let's see if I can get the screen to share. So these are relatively recent photos. Um, this is uh, Abdur Anwar. He's He's the guy with the fancy uh, edge machine. Um, so he, he decided the other day he was gonna take a picture of the, the Leo Trio. And so what you see here is, uh, as you can see in the text up above, he's got several bright galaxies, the ones that we normally are familiar with. Plus, if you look closely, there's a lot of those background objects that are galaxies as well. Mm -hmm. I think some of those I'm pointing to, hopefully. <laughs> so that's, so that's not the Leo trio. Can I talk? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah. that's a weird one. It's up in the neck of it's up in the neck of Leo. Hmm. Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, this is Miles. Yes, we can hear you, Miles. Yeah, that's the quartet. It's one of my favorite quartets in the whole yeah. sky. Huh. The fourth galaxy is a little tougher than the, th the other three, though. Yeah. And it's also, and it's, also one, you know, it's also left right reversed. Uh, yeah. So he's using a, a C11 with a hyperstar, I guess, to get F2. Yeah. Yeah, so the elliptical can... galaxy up there is a northern one. And the faint one down on the lower left is actually west of, nice. of the three in the sky. Yeah. Nice. So that that's uh, so he he's done a pretty good job with that instrument. He's given us a lot of good for produced a lot of good photos. So the next one up, hmm? while he was out, his second target was a, uh, a magnitude sixteen <laughs> in in uh, in Gemini, able twenty one. So that's pretty damn faint. Obviously, they had a pretty decent night. These were taken out at the Blackfoot staging area, which is about an hour and a bit east of Edmonton on the east side of Elk Island Park. Uh, it's a recreational area, and there's a big parking lot for people who go cross-country skiing out there. And the club in Edmonton has been using it for many years as its primary dark sky observing site. And it can get pretty dark there. The previous week that they were out, somebody had gone out there and set a big bonfire. So it, <laughs> they were enjoying the bonfire, but they weren't being able to photograph very much. I don't know. I might go for the bonfire myself. There. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it would have been pretty cold. Yeah. <laughs> this is Arnold Rivera. He's, he's again chasing stuff off the beaten path. Uh, Sharples catalog again. Uh, this is in... in uh, it's called Lowers Nebula, and it's between Orion and Perseus. Um, and Ar Arnold has that fancy, has a fairly fancy uh, a Schmidt camera almost that he uses. And you can see from the pinpoint nature of the stars, it gives just stunning images. And the next one is uh, Larry Wood. Larry's been a long time observer. Uh, he's only recently been doing, uh, in the last year, been doing photographs. Uh, this, this, they had a little bit of smoke in the air from the bonfire that night. So uh, this one could have been a little sharper, he says, but uh, I think it was pretty damn fine. Our friend, the horsehead. And while he was doing that, he also picked up M42, which is the next one. Actually, I think I got those. I may have missed one of the photographs, and so this may be the oh, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, M, yeah, he had the next one he had was M42. So if you missed yeah. it, we can catch that up next time. Yeah. And uh, and and next next week I'll uh, see if I can pull some information out of a, a long email I got from Roman Eunuch about his uh, trials and tribulations with constructing the 32 inch telescope. <laughs> it's a interesting mechanical and engineering issues. Uh, the telescope's going to be driven by a friction drive and the forces on the drive wheel on the driven wheel are pretty high. <laughs> and his, his, uh, his challenge has been selecting the materials to do it without having galling or deformation and not non-slipping. So maybe I'll give you a quick rundown on that next week. I just got the email tonight. Where is that telescope? This is the one that uh, a, a member who was in Edmonton and has since moved down here donated the 32 inch mirror to Edmonton Center. Okay. And Roman is in the process of building the telescope to house the mirror. Uh, and we already have the observatory for it. It's out at Black Nugget Lake, which is about an hour and a half east and a little bit south of Edmonton. So they, they actually scored the 16 foot ash dome from the University of Alberta when they were decommissioning the Devon Observatory. So it's quite the instrument. They're gonna need a crane to put it into the slit because it's gonna weigh a ton, literally a ton by the time it's done. <laughs> and knowing Roman in the, way he's, in the way he's meticulous with things, it will be observatory quality or professional observatory quality by the time he's done. Well, thanks for uh, sharing those, Dave. Yeah. I'm good. Um, so, Reg, do you have any? Um, no, I don't have too much to uh, to uh, share here, but I'll just uh, share the screen anyway and see if I can bring something up. See that okay? Yep. Okay, so um, a couple of shots. Uh, Dan Posey's been having a lot of fun. Uh, if you don't know, uh, Dan lives in the area on Johnson Street at Cook, and he's right across from three auto malls, uh, and they like to use bright lights to uh, uh, illuminate their cars at night. And he's also gets the rumble of the traffic up uh, Johnson Street. And he's looking south, so he can't get a good shot of Polaris to polar align his scope. So having said all of that, he's had terrific luck, I think, of uh, patch uh, photographing this. And this first is, is the uh, Seagull Nebula, which he uh, caught the other night. And uh, he has 4.2, 4 hours, 24 minutes of exposures with that. And he's using his new um uh ascar uh, 600 uh telescope uh and uh canon ra at iso 600 with that and he's i guess his real uh thing that really helps out is the uh hutech narrow band filter um so uh he's uh i think he's having a great deal of success and th this one is just beautiful as well of the horse head and uh, he took this over two nights uh, and um, it's uh, got a total integration of five hours, 45 minutes, uh, the same equipment um, and uh, slightly different ISO, but uh, you can see the detail and it's just a, a beautiful, beautiful image. So uh, uh, don't, uh, he, he's uh, triumphing over the car dealerships. I think that's great. Uh, then uh, I, I just uh, immortalized um, the pen and pixel uh, team of Randy and Na uh, Mike Nash. So if anyone uh, wants to, you know, they showed them really nice, but I, I encourage you to go back and marvel because uh, look at this, where all these beautiful shadows are and everything like that. And the detail and the position and everything like uh, Randy's sketch is just uh, I was inspired and, and blown away by that, but I can't even hold a pencil anymore, so I'm not going to give it a try, but uh, well, <laughs> well done there. Um, and then here are the uh, Edmonton Rascals Go Deep. 
if you want to look at the more um, more detail, I, I've got the uh, descriptions there for, for some of these shots. Um, and thanks so much, Dave, for uh, <coughs> your connection with the Edmonton group. They're doing wonderful work there. So uh, that's about it for there. But I just wanted to go over the, uh, in case people um, uh, did not look at the uh, weekly update. Uh, first of all, the picture at the top is from uh, Edmonton's very own Alistair Ling, and Alistair's given us a talk or two, and uh, he's come out uh, and visited, us, visited uh, Astro Cafe when we were in a live session as well. So uh, we, we know him well and congratulate him on his uh, image. Um, but uh, a couple of things, uh, Montreal Centre has got an evening on exoplanets, and they talk about the James Webb Space Telescope a new thing that I hadn't really heard about called the aerial mission and uh, talking about uh, the Gaia um, uh, survey as well. So that, that sounds uh, really quite interesting. But the one I thought you might be intrigued in is uh, uh, Peter Broughton's talk on uh, John Stanley Plaskett. And uh, I, some of you will, uh, like me, have bought his biography of uh, um, Plaskett that was uh, released uh, on the year of the 100th anniversary of the telescope. And uh, I've heard him speak and he gives a, a great talk. And his great phrase about Plaskett was that he, he did not suffer from modesty, <laughs> which I, I guess he, he had a bit of a big ego, but he did terrific work and that, that uh, helped him. But click on here if you want to register for that. For the time for that would be, uh, uh, let's see, three from that, uh, 4.30 p.m. Eastern uh, Pacific Standard Time on Thursday the 28th. And um, I guess that's that. And um, then there is a uh, talk on the Friday of Navajo, Navajo Astronomy. And uh, here is Alistair Ling's uh, detailed description of what he did. Alistair does, he, he, he's pretty intense. And all he had to do was write a Perl script to, to loop this thing in. And I'm sure we all could do that. <laughs> That's amazing. At any rate, I don't know what they're feeding these guys in Edmonton, but it's impressive. <laughs> and, and, and with that, I'll stop the share and turn it back to you, Chris. Great, thanks, Rich. Um, does anybody have any um, questions or final comments for this evening? Otherwise, I think we're pretty much gone through the items that were on the agenda for this evening. Uh, somebody yeah. did ask me about uh, yeah. my filter transmission, which was, right. uh, it's, right. who was it that asked? It was me, Brock. Uh, Brock. It was, it's uh, 500 to 575. Okay. I, I use Quite other green. ones too, but but yeah. uh, that that one's that one's the one for the for green. That so, would help. Uh, I get a lot of atmospheric dispersion and full color, and it'd be nice to try just going narrow band just to get rid of some of that. Mike, yeah. I noticed on some of your photographs, you're using one of the Bader Pro Planet filters. Do you want to comment uh, on that? Astronomic. Oh, astronomic. Sorry. Yeah, the astronomic Pro Planet. I've got two actually. I. I, this, I've got a 742 NM plus, and then uh, I, I've got an 807, which I didn't even know existed. I just saw one for sale down in cloudy nights uh, in the States. And uh, I'm, uh, the 742 I, I find is, is, is pretty good. Um, the 807, I, it cuts out a little bit more than I want. Um, um, the, it, uh, it's, meant, it's meant to clean up the IR, right? Is that what it does? Yes. It, 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 it the, 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 the larger the number, the long, like the, the longer the wavelength, the, the more you steady the seeing. And, and, um, but the more you do that, the less, the less information you're getting too, you know, so you're bumping your gain up as the, the more you block. Right. And I'm finding with the 290 NM camera, it's got excellent excellent sensitivity to the ir range and and i can i can go to 742 and still have lots of signal and my my i've got to pump my gain up you know to 
around 250 or 300, but but it, when you're shooting so many frames, it, 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 it works out okay. The 807 will still have its place as well for when seeing is really bad and I'm determined to get something. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, I also have an 850 by ZWO and I don't recommend that for anything, at least not for my equipment. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Brian, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I, I attended the Friends of the Dominion Observatory Sky Party on Saturday night. And I didn't see the regulars for the Rask Victoria on there. And I, can, uh, can someone briefly explain the, the uh, relationship or similar differences between Rask Victoria and the Friends of the Dominion Observatory? That um, they have, they're separate organizations apparently, but uh, do they, there, there must be some overlap and share common ground, literally. There's a lot of overlap between them, Brian. Um, and uh, there's an awful lot of uh, members of uh, the RASC who support them during their summertime star parties. And, uh, as, and there's a lot of people belong to both, uh, both clubs. And um, I, I, we did advertise their, uh, their show on, on Saturday night. Uh, I did not attend myself because uh, I was busy with other things at Saturday night's not a good night for me. So uh, I, I don't Yeah, know. I would, uh, um, Brian, I would have attended as well. And I, in the past, certainly oh. I did a lot of work with FDAO in the summer star parties. Uh, but yeah, normally I would have attended. I was just a little bit tired. Yeah, so the, the um, it was a good, it was an interesting presentation because I've been up Haleakala and it was interesting to hear that Thomas Lowy doesn't have to work up there all the time. They can <laughs> run it remotely. But um, but I, I got the impression that they're the group that runs. They they have a do they have a center up there or a, they um, do they a gift, they, a they, gift they, shop too. Ba ba basically, what happened was the uh, center of the universe uh, <laughs> center lost federal uh, government funding. So basically, some people got together and created a nonprofit, which is what the FDAO is, and they actually run a lot of the original activities uh, through uh, through that nonprofit. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Okay. So I guess hearing none, I'll say, well, thank you very much for attending this evening, everyone. And uh, we're planning to be Thanks. back next week, which will be uh, February 1st, Shutter. Um, <laughs> But where is the year going? And um, reminder then, if you do have any ideas, we still, uh, we would really like to have a nominee for first vice president of the center. Um, so if you feel you could put your name forward, that would be great. And uh, if you think of any uh, awards or anything else, please let uh, Reg or me know. And yeah, and if you have anything for next week uh, or any uh, questions, please don't hesitate to bring them up. And 